Meat plus fire. I mean, it's the convergence of one of the universe's basic elements and a symbol of the Earth's mighty bounty. It shouldn't create anything too special. But this combination connects with humans in such a primal way that there's no Cool Ranch Dorito or Berry Mountain Baja Extreme Blast Soda that can even hope to compete with it. I mean, it's likely one of humanity's first recipes. And the convergence of meat, man, and fire is, and always has been, literal magic. And the word in, in Greek for um, priest uh, and uh, butcher and cook is the same, mageros. And the word magic is buried in that word, uh, the origins of the word for magic, because it was magic, this transformation of this carcass, dead animal, into this food fit for the gods. And as deeply sacred as barbecue is for all of humanity throughout all of our history, for whatever reason, it's seen as a largely masculine act. I don't know if it's like the combination of flame and fire, or if it's the meat and flesh, but combining these two seems to have always been a, a manly thing to do. And this sentiment was especially prominent in the Soviet Union. And the most beloved form of barbecue that was found in the former Soviet Union is shashlik. It's basically a type of shish kebab that's especially loved in the Caucasus and Central Asia, but is found all throughout the former nations of the Soviet Union and beyond. Eating it is considered a vital part of summer. So in order to celebrate the coming of summer, I'm going to teach you guys three different ways how to make shashlik. So grab a bag of charcoal and a big ass bottle of bug spray and as many beers as your back can handle because today I'm going to teach you guys how to make shashlik. When making shashlik, the most important part of it is the selection of the meat. If you have a good cut of meat, well, that's half the battle. Since you'll likely be fairly drunk when you eat it anyway. And I mean, if you weren't drunk, then why are you making shashlik? In the Slavic, Baltic, and Caucasus regions, pork is the most prominent meat. And lamb if you're in Central Asia and parts of the Caucasus. Goat is also not unheard of. Beef or veal can also be used, but it's far less common than other types of meat. Some people cook chicken this way, but I feel that it kind of overcooks the meat and leaves it a bit dry. I feel that the best meat for shashlik is pork, and the best cut of pork is what the Russians call the neck. In English, it's, I guess, the shoulder or the butt. You basically want a thick, meaty piece that isn't too tender or prized, yet thoroughly marbled with fat. Lean cuts of meat used for roasts and stews will turn into a dog chew toy and a more delicate and prized cut of meat will easily overcook and not be able to stand up to the rigors of being skewered and flamed in front of a gathered circle of eager men. That's uh, it's a lesson I learned the hard way in college when I went through my experimental phase. Unlike the typical American-style 1950s frou-frou shish kebabs that have skewered veggies like tomatoes, peppers, mushrooms, onions interspaced in between the meat, these kebabs are purely meat. And I think that that's a good choice because cooking vegetables with meat offsets cook times and you'll end up with incinerated vegetables and undercooked meat. Potatoes can also be skewered and roasted in a similar manner. But if you're going to do this, then you'll need some thick salo or fat back, which was discussed in an earlier video. Together, the fat and potatoes roasted over hot embers is really incredible. This is an example of a cut of meat that for shashlik would be considered absolutely ideal. Well marbled and thick. This is going to make perfect kebabs. First, you want to make sure that you cut the meat against the grain into pieces that are what I would call a, a generous mouthful. <laughs> That's what she said. If your pieces are too big, they'll taste a bit like bland overcooked steaks. And if they're too small, They'll be a bit crispy, kind of like little burnt scabs of meat, and I mean, that ain't good to nobody. Try and distribute the fat in a way that each piece has some, but not too much. For the first marinade, we'll be using dairy as our vector. This might sound a little bit strange as a marinade base, but it is quite common in a lot of Middle Eastern, Indian, and Greek dishes, but they typically use yogurt. Hello, Greece, where the yogurt flows like water. Mmm, yes. When using dairy as a base for marinades, Slavs will almost always use kefir, which is basically a drinkable mix of yogurt and buttermilk. 
The acids and cultures in the kefir will help to break down the protein a bit and make the surface of the meat a little more tender. This also helps the flavors of the marinade to permeate the surface layers of the meat. I've also added onions, whole peppercorns, and salt with a half bulb of garlic. I think the next time I make this, I'd like to add a quote-unquote ass load of crushed garlic, but I was a little bit afraid of making the kebabs a bit too bitter with the potential of burned garlic flavors. To step out of the traditional Slavic kefir marinade, the addition of some Middle Eastern spices would also really make this marinade pop. Cumin, turmeric, and smoked pepper would pair beautifully with this marinade and roasted pork. Exchanging the typical kefir base for a yogurt base is also more than acceptable. And might, in fact, actually be advisable. This marinade resulted in the juiciest and most tender of all of the shashlik that we made, with a crispy delightful skin and a nice outer layer. This marinade is likely the most common to be found throughout the former Soviet sphere, and it's a wine-based marinade. For this, you want to use a sweet white wine, like a dessert wine, like wine that's almost painfully sweet. Give me a drink with all your sweetest Brazilian fruits mixed together. Sweet. Sweet. Sweet! The wine acts as the acid in the marinade. For those who are looking to create their own marinades, just keep in mind that some sort of acid is required, be it citrus, vinegar, wine, yogurt, tomato based, or you know that venomous white hot fire I spit on my latest mixtape. Make sure you guys subscribe to my SoundCloud. To your wine base, you'll add various spices to the marinade. While the yogurt based marinade can have a bit more of an Indian Middle Eastern kick to it, the wine marinades pair much more with continental flavors. A one uh, admission for the continental breakfast. You can just help yourself, sir. Oh, interesting. European style. Bay, thyme, rosemary, peppercorn, cilantro, parsley, garlic, really any flavor that's typical of Europe will be great to add to this. The wine I used wasn't quite sweet enough. I think the next time I do this, I'll try and find a much sweeter wine. It helps add a little bit more flavor to the meal. Also, as an ancient Georgian secret, I'll be adding some mineral water to the wine bath. The salts and minerals in the water help to add flavor to the shashlik, all while giving your meat a gentle bubble bath. This marinade resulted in a flavorful and incredibly juicy kebab with a subtle sweetness left behind by the wine. For the third round of shashlik, we're going to be using a dry rub. While a dry rub on kebabs produces a slightly drier meat, it's just because they're cut into relatively small pieces, the flavors and textures that this creates is just incredible. For these, I've chosen to use the best cut of meat that I've had with the most consistent marbling of fat. Dry rubs won't have the moisture of the marinade to rely on, so you'll need the internal fat of the meat to ensure that your kebabs come out juicy. The spice blend for my dry rub consists of Humeli Suneli, a Georgian spice blend that I described in my Lobio video, mixed with powdered garlic, cayenne, fenugreek, salt, and fresh black pepper. Feel free to experiment with any spice blends that you might prefer, since I feel like the most important part of using a dry rub is the meat itself, so, you know, go nuts. When seasoning your meat, make sure you do it on a cutting board or counter, not in a bowl or constrictive container. You want to make sure that each piece is equally coated in spice. I have to say that while the other two marinades were incredible, the spice blend mixed with the beautifully marbled pork made this one the best in show. It was nearly unanimously the favorite of the day, and it was incredibly juicy. Oh, so juicy. Oh my god, it's so juicy! Yo so here we have our two marinades and our spice rub. Good god almighty, these things look beautiful. Let's sit in the fridge overnight, but not longer than 24 hours, because you can over marinate your meat. Something I learned in eighth grade. I also bake bread, y'all. So with our meat sleeping peacefully in their plastic prisons, we're ready to call it a day. Because tomorrow we're waking up bright and early to head out into the great outdoors. Because tomorrow we're going to cook up some shashlik. So, sweet dreams, my little kebabs. The next day.
There are three vital elements to enjoying shashlik as intended. One is good meat, and the second is to be surrounded by nature. While you can easily order this dish in many restaurants, to really get the most out of your Soviet barbecue, you need to be removed from the hustle and bustle of daily life and go somewhere where you can just connect with the great outdoors. This is not a meal to be rushed, but one to be experienced. If it's in a village miles from civilization or in your own backyard, a healthy dose of sunlight and fresh air are just as important for enjoying these kebabs as is salt and fire. So when making shashlik, make sure you take time to soak up some nature. Hopefully before you're too drunk or full to really enjoy it. The first thing you want to do is get your coals roaring hot. They must first burn down to embers before you can cook on them. It might sound a bit counterintuitive, but you really don't want to cook these over direct flame. Meaning that Al Bundy was, was actually right. But this is the best burger I've ever had. What's your secret? <laughs> well, the secret's in the ashes, Steve. See, I never clean my grill. Ashes from the past for burgers of the future. The first two elements that make shashlik great are meat and nature, but the third is good company. Even the most incredible meal is only as good as the people you have to share it with. So make sure that you experience this meal with people close to your heart. I personally don't know anyone like that, so I just invited these assholes instead. So you took a dump in the... <laughs> in the lake? In the yeah. lake, yeah, yeah, okay. I don't even need toilet paper. Use a oh, dog cup just running around. Yeah, yeah. I was a child. <laughs> oh yeah, baby. Burn, baby, burn. Prep your sides and veg while you wait for the fire to die down. Also, take this time to get your buzz on. As the fire starts to die down, go ahead and skewer your meat in rapt anticipation of what's to come. Once on the grill, these will need to be watched, because as the fat renders from the meat and drips onto the coals, it will ignite. This flaming fat, also my drag queen name on weekends, is an enemy to your shashlik and needs to be put out immediately. Keep a beer on hand for the sole purpose of putting out these flare-ups and ensuring your meat doesn't burn. You could use water too, but why? Beer's better. Shashlik is typically served with thick slices of bread, thin slices of onion, green onion, herbs, and a hearty vegetable salad, typically consisting of tomatoes and cucumbers. Rotate and reposition frequently to make sure that the shashlik cook evenly on all sides on each skewer. Once done, remove from heat and put into an oven-safe container that can later be placed onto the warm coals at the end of the evening to reheat the meat for seconds, if you're sober enough for this task. Cut and skewer your spuds with a slice of salo sandwich between them. The fat helps add flavor and keeps them from burning. Careful. Oh my god. Mm -mm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Slowly. <laughs> Gather the troops and divvy out the portions of these beautiful kebabs. You can slowly add more skewers to the coals as the day turns to dusk, and people will continue to nibble on them as the crowd gets more lubricated. The beautiful combination of meat, nature, and good friends have all come together and been expressed through food and fellowship. As simple as this meal is, it really is a great way to bring people together and celebrate life and community. This is a meal that is more about the experience than the flavors and technique used to make it. So with the promise and oppressive heat of summer laid out before us in her sweaty and mosquito-y glory, I highly recommend you guys take a weekend and grab some friends, meat, and what a Mormon would call a concerning amount of booze, and skip town for an afternoon and enjoy this beautiful dish with some incredible people. So what are your favorite grilled or barbecued dishes? What do you bring to the cookout? Let me know in the comments below. Until next time, eat well friends.